My name is Michelle. My last name is Spite. I lost an aunt on May 14th and a cousin. What are the chances that two of your family members would be in the same place from two different sides of your family? This is the first time I really had to process this for myself as I've been an advocate for my families that couldn't be as strong to speak for themselves. The calculated manifesto that you derive, the way that you started on a street that I grew up on. You journeyed down my grandmother's street and then wound up at Tops and killed two of my family members. My cousin Pamela Young, that was, Pearl Young was her mother. She was her only daughter. So I stand here to represent James Young, her son, Damon Young, her son, Pamela Young, her daughter, and all of her grandchildren, Oriana, Greg, Nate, and a host of others. I'm going to read Pamela's statement. She could not be here today. It's entitled Residency. What will take up residency? Will it be May 14th, 2022? Or the court appearance, or every interview, or every time I've had to send my mother's death certificate to an insurance company with the cause of death being multiple gunshot wounds to the head. You didn't shoot her once, but you turned around and shot her two times. So much so that her, her viewing could not even be made by her family. I don't feign strength, great strength. Some mornings I wake up with questions of why my mother. I still recall the day I viewed my mother's body for the final time at the funeral home. Her face held no familiar semblance, and I couldn't even get her wedding ring on her finger because so much of her was distorted. I am jealous of my friends and family because they can remember all the beauty of her smile, and I grapple with my final image. But then I think, what has the right to take a residency in my mind? I remember being an eight-year-old girl traveling with her to UB as she completed her college degree. The experience of watching her earn her degree and realizing that I could attain one. She was my inspiration. I remember my mother's advice on the day of my marriage, her presence at the births of all three of my children. There, also, there was also a time, nearly 15 years ago, when she lived with me for six months. She needed to recover from a major surgery in a home where she could maneuver around easily. My mother spent those months with me and my husband. We drank coffee together and talked for hours. I was so grateful to be able to care for her as she had done for me throughout my childhood. I vividly recall October 31st, 2019, the night my husband passed away unexpectedly. I arrived at her house full of tears. She brushed my hair as I lay on her lap as if I were five-year-old girl again. I have so many other memories that I've decided to write them in my journal. May 14th will always be a memory of a heinous and monstrous act of violence perpetuated by an angry man against my mother simply because of her race. An act of hatred and white supremacy. But I won't allow it to take up residency in my mind. Not when there is so much more about my mother that deserves residency there. So when my mind is invaded by May 14th, 2022, I will allow the tears to fall and the question of why to utter from my lips. But afterwards, I'll take out my journal to remember all the precious moments with my mother. Two minutes and three seconds won't steal those memories. But Peyton, I hope you are haunted every day and every night.
I hope nightmares invade your sleep and convict and conviction be your constant companion. You came to Buffalo with hatred and anger in your heart. You terrorized a community, took the life of my best friend, but your anger and hatred is not greater than my love for my mother. Beautiful thoughts of her are in my mind as I write tonight. I, I'm reminded of one of my favorite scriptures and it says, now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Philippians 4 and 8. This will take up residency in my mind. Pamela Young Pritchett. And the final reading on behalf of the Morrison family, um, specifically um, Fred Morrison and his mother, who is 72, who on her birthday buried her son. Thanks, Peyton, for that. Dear sirs, the dreadful afternoon of May 14th was the day my world was turned upside down. My life has been altered in unimaginable ways. The sheer agony I felt waiting at the Mikowski School for the confirmation that my brother was one of the victims of this senseless massacre by a white supremacist is riveting. I never imagined my best friend, my only left brother, one who I shared holidays, birthdays, football game days, and most remarkably, our most precious gift we share in our mom. Now, all mom and I have left are a million questions of why, tons of lifeless pictures and a plethora of distant memories and countless tears of insurmountable pain. Thank you for that, Peyton. Oftentimes, my daily struggle is the feeling of not even wanting to live my life without him. Margus and I were inseparable. Margus was the middle son, the only living brother I had the one that fiercely protected me and my mother. He was preceded in death by my eldest brother who died suddenly from a heart attack. Now guess what, Peyton? I'm reliving the pain of loss all over again on an entire new level. Since his murder, I sometimes find myself challenged by not being able to sleep soundly, paranoia going through stores, and in my daily routine, always watching my back as if there was a target attached to me. The added responsibility of being the primary caretaker for our mother who suffered a stroke, in case you were concerned, and losing capacity to speak. I'm now left as the only child and pillow she sheds her tears of missing her baby boy Marcus Morrison on. No mother, no mother should have to bury their child, but my mother, buried her son, Margus, on her 72nd birthday. And Margus' daughter buried her dad on her 16th birthday. I hope you spend the rest of your life, every second, every minute, every hour, rehearsing the daunting sound of the screams and the echoes of the lives you snuffed out. I pray that when you blink your eyes, Peyton, you close them at night to sleep and you see images of the slain and feel the burden of the sorrow from every family member and friend of the fallen loved ones in our entire community of 514. I pray that every second and every minute of your 24 hours will haunt you as the absence of my brother at every birthday, holiday, game day, family gathering, and all the other times we share. They have now become nothing but gloom and grueling for me and my family. The fact that you can sit in this courtroom with no remorse, flat affect, emotionless, shows the essence of your privilege, sir. One that my brother never had and never will. 
The fact that you are surrounded by white officers after you casually surrendered while my brother's blood drained from his body is a testament to society that we have a long way to go. And some people's blood is just not as important as others. Thus the reason you lived and you have the privilege of being protected. Needless to say, there is one, and I must address you, there is one Peyton that sees all and you will not escape the fury of the Almighty. One scripture is true in the Bible, and that is, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and he will repay. I pray he is merciful because I too need mercy. So I pray he is merciful to let you live so that you can be reminded of the innocent blood that my brother shed behind your calculated, sinister, demonic act that caused my beloved brother to be snatched from our family. If you don't know God, Peyton, I invite you to find him because you are going to need him. With deep sorrow, Fred Morrison, brother of Marcus Morrison. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you.